Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Jasper de Hoyer. He's the CTO and co-founder of Seda Protocol. And Seda is a sort of universal Oracle protocol, so looking forward to getting into that. Uh, before we uh, start talking with Jasper, I uh, just would like to briefly tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. All right, cool. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on, Jasper. It's great. It's great to, to have you here. Thank you for having me, Brian. Super excited to be here. Yeah, like tell us maybe, first of all, how did you get into crypto and how did that sort of, how did that road lead you to Seda? It's a fun story. So I think I bought my first crypto just purely as a speculator. Some in like my first uh, first year of college, I think in 2016 uh, or second year. And uh, I ended up dropping out of college to start this company that was doing data analytics on uh, mostly Facebook data. And me and two friends did it. We ended up getting aqua hired, but we got increasingly frustrated with the way uh, Facebook managed API access. So instead of being able to like innovate on the product that we were building, we were constantly just like running around with duct, like metaphorical duct tape, fixing like problems because of them essentially rug pooling uh, API access to certain endpoints, et cetera. So it was super hard to build a sustainable like business that was able to innovate. And instead you're just like fixing the, the, the product that we had. That really sort of stifles innovation from third-party developers. Um, and that's what got me more interested in like the crypto space because I, I sort of like bought the script, I kept like an eye on the market. And then as soon as I, the, the, the moment where it clicked was sort of like seeing smart contracts as immutable API interfaces. So the idea that you always know that this data will be accessible and you can sort of like as a third-party developer have this permissionless composability to build third-party applications on existing uh, infrastructure. Um, the way that empowers developers is what really, really sort of like was the aha moment for me. So I, I dove into the space, um, had a programming background, taught myself Solidity, did some consulting, ended up doing sort of like a independent research uh, funded by the Ethereum Foundation with a, with a few other people. Uh, we were researching Plasma, uh, which turned into rollups. So we were trying to build ETH L2s. That was really cool, learned a lot, surrounded myself with smart people. And that was the thing that sort of like kept me in, in the beginning, um, because I joined like full time back in late 2017, early 2018, like right before like a super brutal bear market. But the 
sort of like the the level of intellect and like the, the people that were in the space was was so like magnetic to me it was such a it was such a pleasure to work in such a young industry where everybody was hungry and had a mission it was really that that that's what's really got me going next to sort of like the initial um sort of like a uh, interest into into smart contracts um ended up meeting my co-founder at a hackathon uh, in 2018 we started building products in the space and uh yeah that's uh that's that's how i rolled into it cool thanks so much and then so with seda protocol what's what is the vision for seda so, so how i describe seda is sort of like as a as a, as a layer for data that should be accessible to any developer, right? So if you look at sort of like the infrastructure um, cycle across crypto, starting from the beginning, it's, you have Bitcoin as sort of like this application-specific L1, right? It just does accounting value transfer. That's essentially what it does. And then uh, Ethereum popping up and allowing developers to build sort of like arbitrary business logic in the form of smart contracts uh, that then have this composability and people build like a, a suite of different products on. And when Ethereum was launching, like nobody knew what the use cases would be that actually would got, get traction. That's sort of like the beauty of it. The beauty of it was that anybody could come in, deploy a smart contract, and then any other person could interact with it, right? And I think that that sort of like permissionless creation and permissionless access is what created this giant network effect of what became crypto. And we're not seeing that with a lot of the infrastructure today. So a lot of the infrastructure providers that are very necessary, such as data infrastructure, like oracles, for example, um, or bridges, they still act as sort of like kingmakers and gatekeepers, right? Like you have these startups or, or larger companies that essentially you need to prove to them that you're worthy of deploying to your chain or like allowing access to like a new feed or allowing allowing you to access their data uh, from, from a new environment. And it all has to do with sort of like technological trade-offs that were made and that were necessary at the time because a lot of these projects were built when there was only one chain. And with Seta, the goal is truly to build like this entry point to real world data or data outside of a blockchain's own execution environment that can be accessed from any L1 or L2 and where you can essentially spin up your own data feeds, right? So you can deploy a program on the SETA network that essentially dictates what data should be queried where and how it should be computed that then gets stored on the SETA network. And from there it's accessible uh, or verifiable uh, from any smart contract on any uh, L1, L2, or or sort of like crypto network. Okay, okay, cool. So you said, uh, first of all, right, the, the data, like you want to have off-chain data uh, or, or data that's at least outside of this particular chain or this particular context, you want to have that accessible. And of course, the reason is sort of, right, all, even today, right, a lot of things rely on let's say chain link right for maybe writing uh price feed onto onto the chain right that like maybe okay what is the usd to ether price or something like that right so and of course there's a lot of like yeah other applications right where you say like or like what what, what do you feel like are some of the applications that like you're most excited about that you think would get enabled by having that capability yeah, I think that there's a, a, a few things to touch on here. I think the first thing, and you sort of touched on this, is it's, it's not just price feeds. Um, I think that when people hear the term Oracle, uh, they sort of immediately think of price feeds as the use case. But I would actually argue that there is like the category of Oracle is extremely broad. Uh, I like to say that almost everybody's essentially trying to solve the Oracle problem in this space, right? Like bridging is essentially an Oracle problem solution, right? It's like an application specific Oracle. Price feeds an Oracle, real world assets is an Oracle problem solution. I think that um, you could even argue that Uniswap, for example, is essentially an Oracle where there's a economic incentive to arc the price to uh, centralized exchange prices, right? And that, that way it reflects sort of like off-chain data. The use cases that I get most excited about are 
still DeFi, just so price feeds, but also interoperability, uh, real world assets, the, the things that I sort of mentioned. And the thing that excites me the most about what we're building is sort of like the permissionless aspects of deploying new things. So just like Ethereum launched and had no idea what would really stick, we have a better idea of the things that work, so like the low hanging fruit, but the, the new things we enable is where for me, the real sort of like mystery still lies, right? Like as soon as there's like fully permissionless data access for any L1, I have no idea what people and developers will come up with. And so it's like this idea of empowering developers is what really is super interesting to me. Um, and then the second thing is, as we are seeing the app chain thesis or modularity thesis or whatever you want to call it sort of play out over the last sort of year and a half, and I feel like it's going to go exponential uh, in the next uh, year and a half, there is core infrastructure that's necessary to enable a ton of use cases on these new rollups and app chains, right? And I think probably the most core is having access to real world data. So I think that the idea of being able to launch an app chain, let's say we launch Seda today, tomorrow I could launch a rollup and immediately have access to all of Seda's data, which means that I have base uh, interoperability and access to price feeds and developers can just start building or we as an application specific network have access to the data that we, that we need. You know, like I think that is, th th those things are the things that get me the most excited about the product that we're building. Okay, cool. Well, let's let's go a little bit into details into how this works. So you mentioned SEDA network. So right. So my understanding is SEDA network is a Cosmos SDK chain you're building, right? And then is SEDA network basically the way I understood it? A developer would go on SEDA network and then would sort of almost like create a job there and say, hey, I want like X data on Y chain and maybe set a few parameters or something like that. That is essentially how it works, big picture. If, if we dive a bit deeper, that's how it works is we have set a chain, which is used for settlement and checkpointing, right? So it's like where slashing happens and staking happens and where data references and like you said, jobs, uh, which we call programs, are stored. If we go through the flow of Seta Chain, I can deploy a program on Seta Chain that essentially is a set of instructions on how data should be queried from where and how a final outcome should be computed, right? So for a price feed, it could be like query ETH to USD from six exchanges and then give me a median value. Right? That, that could be some of the instructions that you give it to this program. And then the program is deployed almost like a smart contract. Um, so it's stored on the chain. And then if you want that data to be queried, if you want to get that data answered, then what you do is you ping the chain referencing sort of like the contract address or ID of that program. And then the chain picks a verified uh, secret random committee of a second layer, which we call the overlay layer, um, which is a network of MPC nodes that get randomly selected to actually perform that computation. So from like a technical perspective, the program is stored as a wasm binary. This wasm binary um, gets executed by the overlay nodes in, in a wasm VM. So they all get essentially some sort of uniform outcome that should be close to the same outcome. And then they commit that back to set a chain. On Seta chain, what we then do is we batch all of the feeds or all of the uh, jobs together uh, and we merkleize them and have them signed at the end of the block. Maybe we can walk through this like uh, a bit more slowly. So you mentioned, so let, let's take this example, right? So, so you mentioned like, I don't know, roll up or someone launches like some chain or we yeah, roll up, or maybe it's like some, let's just say it's some Cosmos SDK chain or something. And they want, they want what you mentioned, right? So they want to have the price feed and they want to have, yeah, the median of the six largest uh, centralized crypto exchanges to write like, you know, just a sim simple, uh, simple price feed. So they, you deploy this program on Seda chain and, and then the chain chooses sort of like, kind of like a particular set of nodes to then perform this job? 
Exactly. So we do okay. like, um, yes. So the chain uses VRFs to uh, pick from like a larger pool of validators because tender mint validator sets uh, have some scaling, scaling issues. Yeah. Okay, but is this the people, uh, sort of the nodes who write this data afterwards, are these the validators or these are other nodes? Yeah, so these are not the SETA chain validators. There can be overlap, but this is like a, a second set of, uh, of nodes, yes. So the second set of nodes, and then some are basically chosen sort of randomly from that set. Yep, yep, and it's like a secret random committee, so they don't know which other nodes have been selected either. It's like to prevent collusion. They don't know beforehand, or they, they don't even know at the time. Or... So they don't know beforehand, and they only know after sort of like the commit stage, right? So then after they commit the, the outcomes, they know which other nodes were, uh, were selected, of course, because the, the chain is now is, is public. Is it, is it like a fixed number of nodes are chosen or it depends on the security requirements of a particular program? Yes. So the program can set like the replication factor, like how many of the overlay nodes uh, they want to have run this feed. And it depends on the, it depends on a bunch of things, right? So that way you can sort of like cater uh, data security based on the use case that you use it for. So if it's for something that doesn't, have a lot of risk of uh, if it's something basic or, or non-DeFi related, like it's okay maybe if it's like a small set of overlay nodes. If it's something that holds a lot of value, you probably want to increase the replication factor. And then as somebody who creates this program because I want this job, I then, for example, basically fund, I put some money into this program that then pays the, the node operators who... Yep, yeah. So when you ping the chain and reference the program in order to have it executed, you provide some gas fees essentially for computation. Uh, computation gets done. When you say ping the chain, like who pings the chain and how? Yeah, so anybody can ping the chain to say like, hey, query this price feed, right? So if you have a price feed that you want to have updated at a fixed interval, for example, you can ping the chain at that interval. And we're working on something we call continuous data requests as well, which essentially sets, hey, for the next X amount of time, ping every 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 time essentially within the interval or or set a condition when you want the it to be what want it to be ping. Um, that's completely permissionless, right? So anybody can do that. Like you can write a program that pings the chain directly. You could fire an event on your destination chain. So I, I launch a rollup, I fire an event there that's then picked up by, I don't know, some solver or relay that sees, hey, they want this data, so we are gonna do it for them and bridge it back. There's like a bunch of uh, a bunch of ways this can be done, but it, yeah. Right, because the ping happens on, say, the chain. Yes. Right, right. And then and then the result is written to the, some destination chain. The result is written to set a chain first, where it's then batched with any other requests that come in in the same block. And at that point, you collect the batch, which we do in like a, a Merkle tree. And then, like I mentioned, we sign the root. So from there, as, as, as soon as the root is signed with a batch of data, you can verify the signature from our uh, validator set, essentially from any smart contract and verify that the chain is a certain state. So what's cool there also is if one person or a group of people fund an ETH to USD price feed that is updated every minute, any other chain now also has, also has access to that, uh, to that data because all of the data is stored uh, essentially in this, in this manner. Okay. And then you need some... You need like on the destination chain, you need to be able to verify, right, that signature. So, so you need to keep track of like the validator set or? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the great thing about Tendermint is that the validator set is not, does not change that much, right? And we have this, uh, we have a pretty, pretty vanilla chain, I say, I'd say, but there's uh, one extra condition, which is that if you uh, leave the active set, 
you're still required to at least sign the um, uh, the roots, the the batch roots for another epoch, uh, which you're still deciding on. It's like next twelve hours or something. Oh, so the epochs are relatively short. Or... Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like twelve hours to two days. We're thinking. Yeah, and and then that's the most often that the validator said could change. So that's the yeah, you would not have to sort of update on each chain, destination chain, and more not often too frequently. than yeah, not no. too frequently. And what's cool is in the in the batches in the Merkle tree, there's always we reference sort of like the next validator set. So as so as long as you have some data pushed within that time frame, somebody can like say, hey, update set and done. Okay. Um, one thing I'm curious about, I mean, I know there's been some discussion in Cosmos on, you know, if something like BLS signatures where you basically sort of can aggregate a lot of um, different signatures in, in a single signature, like doing something like that. Is that something that would be very useful here because you could reduce the size of this thing or does that matter for you guys? Yeah, for sure. We built uh, a BLS signature uh, implementation. Uh, we built we built a few um, because not every smart contract chain has access to the same cryptographic hashes or sorry, the, the same cryptographic curves. So we, we built a few signatures um, that, that can be uh, applied to the batches so that they can be at least verified with subsidized verification functions on uh, most VMs. Yeah, what, what else is important about, what are we missing sort of from this process of like the chain, you know, goes there, there's this program, now you have to know it's being chosen, they're right on there. Yeah, I, I think the, the one thing we can touch on is sort of like the, the way that data is then transported, transmit, yeah, transported from setup chain to the destination chain, because essentially what you have now is like you're essentially collecting data on our network, right? And yes, it's verifiable, but how do you incentivize people to then bridge that data back to the, the chain where the data is actually supposed to be consumed? And for this, it's almost like an intent-based network where there could be multiple reasons why somebody would go there and sort of like bridge the data back to the destination chain. And the first one would be if there's MEV exposed, right? So we can essentially run a lending network on an, on an L1 that we spin up ourselves or, or, or an app chain that we spin up ourselves. Um, use that as a data source. And as soon as there's liquidations uh, that's supposed to happen, then solvers can come in and then choose to bridge the data over and perform the liquidations. Wait, wait, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I didn't totally get this. Uh, so, okay, I understand, right? The challenge is that basically now the program is running and it has some price feed and then it now that's written on to say, say the chain. And now the question is, I guess, how does it get to the destination chain? Yeah, how do you incentivize somebody to to bridge it over right so it can either be if we run the lending protocol like we can run our own solver to sort of like bridge this data over and perform the liquidations or you can rely on third-party uh solvers or so like searchers sol is a solver because it sounds kind of like a relay to me i guess solver is would be in the case if it's like integrated in some let's say some kind of exchange type thing that Relies yeah, on solvers. Exactly. Or... Exactly. So you because it's like permissionlessly queryable, you can just add the uh, ability for solvers to essentially bridge the data uh, or bridge the proof with any action that it would normally do to perform, I don't know, liquidations on perp dexes or uh, lending markets. So basically, there's like different ways that this can happen. And... I mean, I guess one example would be, you know, I create some application on X chain and I want to say the price feed and I, as the application, I, I'm just going to run some kind of, um, you know, relay and I'm just picking it up and I'm putting it over there. And, you know, I have some external incentive because I want this application to run. I guess that would be one 
my model yep. for sure. Is it also part of the program that I could just say, hey, anyone can do this relaying thing and if they do it, they get paid some fee? Yep, yep. So that's the bounty idea, right? So you essentially place a bounty on the destination chain that covers gas fees and then some uh, for bridging the data over and that way you outsource it. Um, and then the final one is, like I said, is like, I, I just build it as a source for liquidations, for example. And I assume that at some point when a liquidation occurs, that exposes MEV. So there's like an incentive for third parties to come in and bridge the data over, right? So it's, it's essentially the same thing as a bounty, except like you don't place the bounty. It's just part of your network. When you say liquidations, that will be some kind of, can, can you walk us through an example? For this yeah of course so let's say we have a lending protocol and i hold a position of um i borrow um usdc against eth or something at, at some liquidation uh ratio as soon as the price of eth drops below the liquidation threshold there is a fee to be made for liquidating that position right so if you can bridge the proof from seta to that chain and prove that ETH was below the liquidation threshold, you now earn that fee without the protocol saying like, hey, it's been X amount of time, so you can claim a bounty essentially, right? So you have like other types of incentives to uh, bridge the data over as well that, be, that, that are sort of natural for, for certain DeFi applications. Right, right. Okay, so, so in this example here, of course, this would only work, I guess, if you only need the data, you know, if the data is only needed for the liquidation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so of course, then it's only if there's a liquidation, only if there's that incentive, then someone has, can make money. So that's when they're going to, um, and would they then also, they would then also potentially pay the, to run the, to basically on say the chain, right, to get the data and and then you take that and move it over. If the feed has not been updated to reflect the current price that is below the liquidation threshold, then yes, they would have the incentive to also run the one run the feed, run the program. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean that's a very yeah, it's a very powerful this field looks like a very powerful primitive. Um, one thing I'm curious about, so we, we talked about uh, price feeds because uh, it's, you know, kind of like a known and, 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 and I'm sure it's probably still going to be, or I imagine it's still going to be the largest use case, right? Because in the end, like crypto is basically, um, you know, people build financial applications, right? And they want to trade and then price feeds are kind of essential for that. But I guess if you look sort of at other types of Oracle, other types of data, maybe also data where there's may maybe more of a subjective component. Yeah, I actually say that price is one of the more subjective things that's being pushed on chain uh, today, even actually, because like there's, there's no truth on like what the price of ETH is right now, right? There's like a ton of algorithms that you could use to get as close to the truth as possible, but it's really hard to figure out what is truly the price of ETH now. So you just sort of like take a bunch and then you, you use a bunch of like algorithms essentially to try to get to something that is probably close to the truth, uh, as close as possible. I think that um, more subjective data such as, for example, so, so previously, and that's, that's probably good to touch on as well, we actually build an optimistic oracle uh, as well, which is so, it's more similar to like an UMA or an Augur, which essentially allows you to ask practically any question to the oracle and you essentially have humans coordinate or, or some machine programs or, or humans, anybody could essentially coordinate and come to um, a conclusion of the what the answer to that question is. I think Seta as a primitive, as you call it, which I like a lot, is not really fit for that type of data. It's it's more fit for like API data. But um, yeah, maybe if you could give an example of like the the sort of like more subjective data sources. I mean, I guess you could you could be like I don't know who's you know who's the best band 
in France or what's the best band in France or something like that. Yeah, no, I don't think that unless there's an API for that, it probably would choose something <laughs> else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, but what you could do is you could ask an LLM through setup. Okay. To answer that question. Right. So it, it, I think that is another use case that I forgot to touch on earlier is the fact that because anybody can plug in data to the system, you can query anything from a smart contract. So LLMs, for example, become also accessible to smart contracts through, through setup. But then how would you verify, uh, cause the LLMs are not really deterministic, right? So like you ask ChatGPT something and I ask it something and then, you know, we get different answers and then, so. Uh, yeah, how how would that work? That's a great point. Um, there's two ways. Uh, some of them have deterministic endpoints that have some sort of a seed that you can prove like, hey, this was actually generated by this LLM. The second one, which might be a little bit less sexy, but still works, is that when the data provider plugs into the network, you have them sign the prompts. Right, so let's say ChatGPT is a data provider to Seta. They sign the prompts, and you can verify that 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 um, that the that the prompt at least comes, for, or like the the response at least comes from. OpenAI provides that, for example. They provide yeah, like exactly. signed uh, signed output. Well, not yet, not yet. Okay, but if they would plug into Seta, we would ask them to do that. Yeah. 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 Or or like if if I launch a ChatGPT wrapper on top of Seta, I would sign it, right? So then you don't have proof that it was actually ran by ChatGPT, but at least you have like somebody to point to as like a attestation, essentially. You have proof it was it was run by Jasper, who said he used the ChatGPT. Exactly. So that, that, that that's, it's not it's not that that's not really bulletproof. Depends on depends on who hosts the wrapper, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, I get, I'm sure people are going to have, you know, solve this in some way, right? Where you're going to have some kind of, you know, deterministic, verifiable LLM outputs. Yeah, MidJourney, I believe, has deterministic um, prompt to image. Um, I, I forgot how to do it, but one of our engineers built a, built a prototype using, I believe it was MidJourney. I mean, we were talking a little bit about sort of the deterministic, determinism and verifiability i'm curious are are like zero knowledge proofs something like like how how do zero knowledge proofs sort of intersect with SEDA? i think fully homomorphic encryption could be very interesting for sort of like keeping the data private before it lands on chain um so essentially what you could do is have these overlay nodes that actually do the querying computation perform the querying computation through like a fully homomorphic encrypted service or or, or data providers. I, I think the ZK thing, I, I'm not 100% sure how we could use it except for, for privacy uh, for ZK version of what, what we're at least like it's not on the roadmap yet, but I mean, it's obviously something we think about. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't see much more than that, except for um, like the ability to query zk light clients and prove chain state, like in a more elegant way. That 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 that's something that makes a lot of sense. And then Seta can be used as more of a yeah, like a tra data transport layer, which is essentially designed to do. Right. So, so that, yeah, that's the other topic I wanted to come back to because uh, I, I think you mentioned earlier uh, bridging, right, as uh, as a problem. And of course, bridging is something where interoperability is something where we've seen, you know, a massive amount of activities and investment. I mean, you have like protocol like IBC that has a lot of usage, right, that basically relies on like, you know, light clients in each chain. That you know, there's a lot of usage in Cosmos, but including also a whole bunch of teams trying to bring that you know like everywhere, like things like Polymer Union and other ones. And then of course you have whole other protocols like Wormhole, yeah, things like Axlar or Layer Zero. There's like a, a huge amount of activity there. How does Seda? Do do you think that Seda 
would be like um, a viable alternative or competitor to these existing bridging solutions? Yes. I also think that we can be very complementary to a lot of them, right? So we're talking to some of the teams you mentioned about setup being part of their stack. Some of these solutions still require like oracles or like essentially like somebody to attest data, right? A lot of them are in the end still some sort of multisig, but you try to like make the multisigs, like for example, right, layer zero requires still like an oracle and a relay as they call them, which essentially like two of two multisig in which an oracle and a relayer have to agree on the state of something being something. And they 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 use uh, still like a lot of like RPC data for example. So, okay, so how it works with Seta is because everybody can plug into the network and provide data and anybody can uh, verify Seta Oracle state essentially through some sort of like, what we build is pretty similar to IBC. It's just got like a, like a one-way version, light version of IBC. So RPC providers can provide data to SETA. Like we're talking to a bunch of them and essentially what they do is they open up their API to SETA um, and then uh, people that provide these, uh, people can write programs to query a bunch of RPC providers to verify chain states and then you query multiple for the sake of uh, redundancy. Right. So um, you can write a program that queries like, I don't know, like Infura, Quick Notes, and Alchemy to verify the state of ETH to be a certain, um, to, to verify, I don't know, like, like uh, block hashes or, 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 or contract state. And then you have that run through Seta stored there. And then that can be queried from any L1 that then has essentially has access to that piece of state from Ethereum. Right. So, that could be used by these uh, interoperability protocols as like part of their uh, consensus. And that's, that's something that's, that we were talks to with a bunch of them. And it's, it seems to make sense. And I think that the thing that makes sense most is that fact that as soon as it enters our chain, it's verifiable from any other chain. So you get like this super broad distribution mechanism um, simply just by having the uh, data come into our network. And it's very interesting for RPC providers too, because they get to uh, monitor that data through on-chain uh, traction as well. Not just because right now, essentially RPC providers just sell their data to um, people that want to query chain state from, I don't know, like a server or something. But I mean, that's a, there's a huge demand on-chain to query chain state as well. So we're sort of like allowing them to tap into that as well. Yeah, I mean, to open sort of an additional market there. Yeah, exactly. Is is uh, RPC also something that say the I just did uh, we just did a podcast with uh, Lava Network the other week, right? So and we were talking quite a bit with them, and I mean I think the thing that uh, occurs to me that actually is a lot of similarity here, right? Where I, you know they also basically I right, have some kind of on chain contract thing right that then you know ha requires a bunch of people that they can write run basically rpc nodes uh although i guess in their case not the results wouldn't be written like it, it, on chain right it, it stays off chain right so yeah but all they need to do is plug their uh one of their rpc gateways or whatever they call it into the set of network and now they also get to monetize on chain and I think that that's actually really interesting, especially for like the more distributed RPC networks, because they have like this sort of like permissionless aspect to them as well, right? Like that, that's one of the like core goals of one of these more uh, like, like I know, like the Lava networks or the pocket networks of this world is like to allow access permissionlessly to RPCs and have like super high quality service to distribution, like load distribution and network distribution. I think that plugging that into a network like Seta is extremely, makes a lot of sense. And we are in conversation uh, with with some of these providers as well, yeah. I mean, I guess the sort of flip side is, right, that in, in the end, I guess, SEDA provides this verifiability, right? Because if I'm like, okay, I want to ask what's the balance of, you know, this account on Ethereum or something like that, right? Then 
maybe I want this verified, right? Because it's going to trigger something, right? Or maybe I just want it to show something in the website. And I guess say that would be really good if you want it verified. And something like Lava would be good if you don't need it verified. Or if you don't need it verified on chain. Seta couldn't work without somebody like Lava providing that data to Seta, right? Or, or, or like an Infura. So, and then the more the merrier because you can create redundancy, which increases security even more. So I think that, um, yeah, that, that, that will be the main point actually. Yeah, yeah. But basically, they just had the, the same operators that would serve something like Lava could also serve something like Seda, right? And yeah, I think I think the idea is basically that Lava does the exact opposite for what Seda does, right? The the exact other direction. So they try to make on chain state through RPC accessible to off chain, right? We are trying to make all of the RPC data available on chain. And we don't want to be build our own RPC network, right? Like that, 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 that's a whole different beast to slay. So we would rather have, uh, somebody like Lava plug into our network, um, and provide data and be paid essentially to do what they do already, but for smart contracts. So, I mean, I get that what Seda is, seems very, you know, useful for is, is some degree of interoperability in the sense of. You know, I want like maybe state from something that happens on chain A, it triggers something on chain B, right? Like that, that seems like pretty, you know, like that getting that data over. But then I guess when you look at, let's say, um, of course, one of the main use cases for interoperability is basically moving tokens from one chain to the other. So it means you, you lock it up in one chain and you create some sort of, you know, asset that can be redeemed for the asset on the original chain, I guess that is something that maybe one could theoretically build on top of Seda, but it's not something that like sort of Seda natively will be able to to do, right? Yeah, so so you need to build it into into Seda uh, through the form of a program. But what you could also do is plug it into Hyperlayer Layer Zero, use it as the Oracle, and now you have a super decentralized uh, bridge. Right, so if you if you use Seta using like a third party bridge application that's configurable, all of a sudden you create like this um, sort of like hyper interoperable due to the permissionless aspect, um, sort of like scaling. So that that I think that's really interesting because yeah, you you could you could launch a rollup tomorrow, plug your RPC into Seta, and then uh, use Hyperlane configure the Oracle to be Seta, and now you're interoperable with essentially any of the other chains that also uh, have RPC data available on, on Seta. And I think that that is super powerful. It's like, like you said, it's a primitive. And I think that that's where we need to go in the space, right? Like infrastructure need to be sort of like commoditized and accessible to all instead of being uh, gatekept and sort of like acting as kingmakers. Yeah. Cool. So I know you guys have been working on this for a few years. Like, what is sort of the, like, where are you right now? Yeah. Yeah, so, we, so we've so we been working in the Oracle space for a few years. Um, and it, it's actually, like I mentioned, the Optimistic Oracle we built before, before we also launched uh, a first-party Oracle. Optimistic, or, or like, what's, what's an Optimistic Oracle? Yeah, an Optimistic Oracle is essentially an Oracle that you, you, you ask a question, right? Like, what's the price of ETH? And... Um, somebody will answer it, right? Or a group of people will answer it. And then you have like this dispute resolution mechanism that dictates in the end what the outcome was. So the benefit is it's very accessible. You can ask subjective questions. Uh, the um, annoying part is that it can be incredibly slow if there is, if it's a, if it's like a, a controversial question. Or oh, because you need some challenge period or something. Yeah, you have challenge you periods and then if the challenge period, if within the challenge period there is somebody challenged, then it like extends, right? Sort of like up to a certain point, and it, it can take just super, super long. Um, it's cool, but it requires the use cases are not that obvious, right? You see it with Uma, who um, has built this really cool Oracle, but it's hard to find third party developers that get it enough to build on it. So they end up building a lot of the problem uh, projects that are built on top of their Oracle in house, like 
uh, O Snap or uh, Across, for example. So, so, so we were building that, and then in parallel, we were building sort of like the opposite, which was a first-party oracle, which is purely API data, and we just give essentially software to data providers that then push data on chain themselves directly, um, and that worked really, really well. So we had like a few data providers pushing price data on chain, and the cool thing was that um, we grew from zero total value secured to like over three billion in total value secured over the span of like two months, I believe. So, so, we grew so from like value the, secured, how, how, like what kind of value was secured with that? So it was mostly like lending DeFi, um, but the, so, so, so essentially total value secured, I say is if our Oracle got hacked, how many money could you steal? Right, that's sort of like if if it got exploited, yeah. how much money? Okay, so these were some DeFi protocols that basically uh, dependent on the oracle you guys. Yes, had. exactly. Like the total, like the cumulative total value secured of um, DeFi protocols using uh, Flux first party oracle. Um, so, yeah, we grew to the second largest oracle in the last bull run. Do you know how how big was that number for Chainlink? Like 60 billion? 60 billion, yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe 80. It's like between 60 and 80 somewhere. Yes, so, so we grew extremely quickly, um, which was cool. But we also ran into sort of like the horizontal scaling issues, right? Like you have like this, we were the gatekeepers at that point where we're like, we're picking where we deploy to and like the monitoring of all of these chains, making sure there were balances in all of these chains, making sure... Uh, the validators or the or the data providers were all like happy and pushing and th that everything was going well. It just didn't scale well. And that's why you see these huge wait times for integrations with uh, sort of like these more centrally run uh, Oracle networks. And that, that's really what we were trying to solve. Uh, and that's why we, that's what we, that's when we started designing uh, what became Seda. Um, next up though, uh, at the end of this quarter, uh, we're launching our token migration. So we launched the token. So end of this quarter means like end of March or something. Yeah, yeah, like mid to late March. Uh, we just kicked off audits. Because the SEDA token exists today and it's on Ethereum or... Yes, exactly. So with these previous oracles, we launched a token and that's going to be the same token that's going to be securing a SEDA chain. So we need to have some time to migrate a large part of the tokens over before we go to like mainnet with the Oracle modules. So we're launching sort of like a vanilla Cosmos chain with token migration uh, enabled and uh, are looking to launch the first like Oracle modules to mainnet, uh, hopefully in Q2. So like by Q2, there should be the first mainnet like uh, data flowing to uh, chains through Zeta. Cool, that's exciting. Do you already know some of the some of the first applications or use cases that are people building on top of Sena? Yep, yep. We wanna. So the thing I'm like most passionate about this, I think, for the like the next this and next cycle, is the idea of chain abstraction. Can you explain uh, chain abstraction? Yes. So right now, when you, you have all these rollups popping up, right, and they're all completely siloed off. And as a user, if I want to interact with it, I have to find a way to bridge tokens to it or get tokens to that instance of a chain that I want to interact with. Then I have to go to my wallet, integrate the RPC, swap to the, uh, swap to the correct chain. And it, it's like if I want to switch from Facebook to Instagram, all of a sudden I have to change my IP settings or something. It's a, it's a really, really horrible UX where you like have to bridge your account over like your photos or something i don't know like statuses it's like terrible ux um so the idea of chain abstraction is that you create so i think there's multiple implementations of it but to me it's like you create a single layer that people interact with and then from there there's like in the back end there is actors solvers that actually perform the actions in your name on the destination chains, so you don't ever have to touch them, but you still own representations of those actions so that you have like, yeah, you're the rightful owner of the positions on these other chains. And in order to do that, you need uh, primitives that allow you to query state from all of these chains, right? And you cannot rely 
on like some third party actor to deploy their uh, like interoperability primitive to all of these chains separately. So I think that that is where SETA has an extreme advantage, just the fact that you can permissionlessly deploy SETA on all of these chains and you will always be able to rely on sort of like the same standard to query data to verify whether something happened or not on, on these destination chains. So, so that is something I personally like focus on to make sure we have like, we're working with multiple teams um, that are trying to solve for this. And uh, the other ones are like, I mean, new rollups launching that need, uh, need price data, um, existing rollups that are sick of waiting for another third, uh, for another Oracle to launch on their network and are like, can you guys please go live so that we can have access to like price feeds and like base interoperability and such. I think that the, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the sort of like lowest hanging fruit for now. And then we have some more interesting like niche use cases that we're working at that involve some of the um, like LLM things that, uh, that I touched on earlier that, I, that, are, that, are, that are fun, but are sort of like to see whether they are going to be uh, core of our business. But yeah, that's, that's the, those are sort of like the categories that, that we're focusing on internally. Cool. And then are, are these Ethereum Oracle, are, are these Flux Oracles still running or those have been discontinued? No, we, sh we shut them down. Um, we, we sunset them uh, early last year or like somewhere, somewhere September last year, I think. So the token has sort of been like dormant and kind of waiting for the rebirth of... Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. We've been really stealth also because we, we had this thesis that this is where the space was going. But until we saw it play out, we weren't really comfortable being loud yet. And until we were closer to launching and like confident that we came up with like the correct solution. But now that we are, we, we are a lot more comfortable, uh, going on podcasts and, uh, talking to, talking to a ton of projects about, about what we're doing. I mean, it, it, to me, it sounds like a really logical way of approaching this problem and like something that. Yeah, can see like a, a massive market for this. So sounds very cool. Yeah, yeah, we're super excited. We can't wait to get this thing live. It's uh it it we're ready. Cool. Well, uh thanks so much for coming on, Jasper. So I think if people wanna check it out, right? So the website is like seda so S E D A dot X Y Z. And anything else you wanna sort of chill? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. F f follow us on Twitter at Setup Protocol. Uh, I'm Jasper Flux uh, on Twitter. Um, check out our Discord. Come hang out. Ask questions. Um, if you're a, pro uh, a builder in the space and you're launching your own network, and the idea of finding Oracle providers seems daunting, like reach out. We're happy to spar with you on how to get data to your chain. Talk to you about what data you need and um, yeah, make sure we, we, we're able to support you as soon as we launch. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Jasper. Uh, it was great to have you. And um, thanks so much for listeners for tuning in. We look forward to being back next week.